Hi, this is part 2 of my lecture on GI disorders and pregnancy where I discuss small bowel and colon disorders. Now we move on to small bowel and colon disorders. So first, let's talk about acute diarrhea. Diarrhea can be classified as acute, persistent, and chronic. It is acute when the symptoms has lasted for less than two weeks, persistent if the symptoms or diarrhea has been uh, happening for the past two to four weeks, and chronic if diarrhea has been there for more than four weeks now. Most cases of acute diarrhea are caused by infectious agents and a third result from foodborne pathogens. Evaluation of acute diarrhea depends on its severity and duration. Some indications for evaluation include profuse watery diarrhea with, de with dehydration, grossly bloody stools, fever that's greater than 38 degrees centigrade, duration of more than 48 hours without improvement, recent antimicrobial use, and diarrhea in the immunocompromised patient. Cases of moderately severe diarrhea with fecal leukocytes or gross blood may best be treated with empirical antibiotics rather than evaluation. And here is a table that shows to us the etiology, clinical features, and treatment of common acute di diarrheal symptoms. So here we can see the toxic or the toxin producers are usually Staphylococcus, uh, Clostridium perfringens, E. coli, and uh, B. cereus. So we also have here the enteroadherent agents, E. coli, Georgia, and helminths. As you can see here on the last column, the treatment for E. coli, which is ciprofloxacin. For Georgia, it's tinidazole. And for the helminths, um, it depends on which helminth was uh, detected. Okay, so down the line, we have the cytotoxin producers, inflammatory agents, and so on and so forth. So the mainstay of treatment for diarrhea is intravenous hydration using normal saline or ringer lactate with potassium supplementation. This is to restore maternal blood volume and to ensure adequate uteroplacental perfusion. Vital signs and urine output are monitored for signs of sepsis syndrome. For moderately severe non-febrile illness without bloody diarrhea, anti-mobility agents such as loperamide, uh, the, usually the brand is Imodium, may be useful. Bismuth subsalicylate or peptobismol may also alleviate symptoms. For women who are moderate or severely ill, some recommend empirical treatment with ciprofloxacin 500 mg twice daily for 3 to 5 days. Severe illness that is caused by salmonella is usually treated by or with ciprofloxacin. Uh, severe illness that is caused by a uh, Campylobacter species is treated with azithromycin. Severe illness that is caused by Clostridium difficile is treated by metronidazole or vancomycin. And severe illness that is caused by Georgia and Entamoeba histolytica is treated with metronidazole. Acute diarrhea that is caused by Clostridium difficile infection is usually transmitted by the fecal oral route. The most important risk factor for this infection is antibiotic use and the highest risk is with aminopenicillins, clindamycin, cephalosporin, and chloroquinolones. Other risk factors include inflammatory bowel disease, immunosuppression, advanced age, and gastrointestinal surgery. Diagnosis is by enzyme immunoassay for toxins in the stool or by DNA-based tests that identify toxin genes of Clostridium difficile. Only patients with diarrhea should be tested and post-treatment testing is not usually recommended. Prevention is by soap and water hand washing and infected individuals should be isolated. Treatment is by oral vancomycin or metronidazole. Next is inflammatory bowel disease. Two presumably non-infectious forms of intestinal inflammation are ulcerative colitis and Crohn disease. Differentiation between these two is very important because the treatment differs. Both of these uh, share common features and sometimes are indistinguishable if Crohn disease involves the colon. 
inflammation is thought to result from dysregulated mucosal immune function in response to commensal microbiota with or without an immuno or an autoimmune component. And here is a table which shows to us the shared and the differentiating characteristics between ulcerative colitis and Crohn disease. Okay, so for ulcerative colitis, this is a mucosal disorder with inflammation that is only confined to the superficial luminal layers of the colon. In approximately 40% of cases, the disease is confined to the rectum and rectosigmoid, but 20% have pancolitis. Endoscopic findings include mucosal granularity and friability. The, these are what you see here in this picture on the right. And this is interspersed with mucosal ulcerations in a mucopurulent exudate. Major symptoms include diarrhea, rectal bleeding, tenesmus, and abdominal cramps. Toxic megacolon and catastrophic hemorrhage are dangerous complications that may necessitate colectomy. Extraintestinal manifestations include arthritis, uveitis, and erythema nodosum. The risk for colon cancer for ulcerative colitis is about 1% per year. So what about Crohn disease? This is also known as regional enteritis, Crohn elitis, and granulomatous colitis. It involves not only the bowel mucosa, but also the deeper layers and sometimes involvement is transmural. Lesions can be seen throughout the entire GI tract from the mouth to the anus, but it is typically segmental. Perianal fistulas and abscesses develop in a third of those with colonic involvement. Symptoms depend on which bowel segment is involved. Thus, complaints may include lower right-sided cramping, abdominal pain, diarrhea, weight loss, low-grade fever, and obstructive symptoms. The disease is chronic with exacerbations and remissions, and importantly, it cannot be cured medically or surgically. Reactive arthritis is common, and the GI cancer risk, although not as great as with ulcerative colitis, is increased substantially. Ulcerative colitis does not usually significantly alter the course of pregnancy or pregnancy outcomes in affected women. In women with active disease at the time of conception, approximately 45% worsened, 25% remained unchanged, and only 25% improved. Osteoporosis is a, is a significant com complication of this disorder. So vitamin D, 800 IU daily and calcium at 1,200 mg daily should be given. Folic acid at at least 4 mg orally daily is recommended preconceptionally and during the first trimester for neural, neural tube defect prevention. So the treatment of active colitis and maintenance therapy incorporate drugs that deliver 5 amino salicylic acid or mesalamine. Sulfasalazine is the prototype and its 5-ASA moiety inhibits prostaglandin synthase in colonic mucosa. Others include osalazine, balsalazide, and delayed release 5-ASA derivatives such as apriso, asacol, pentasa, and lialda. Glucocorticoids are given orally, parenterally, or by enema for moderate or severe disease that does not respond to 5-ASA. Recalcitrant disease is managed by immunomodulating drugs including azathioprine, 6-mercaptopurine, or cyclosporine, which are relatively safe in pregnancy. Antibodies against tumor necrosis factor alpha may be given for treatment of ulcerative colitis and include infliximab, adalimumab, and golinumab. These are administered intravenously or subcutaneously. Several studies showed that these are safe for use in pregnancy. However, these drugs may cause immunosuppression in the neonate. So on the other hand, we have Crohn's disease that uh, in general, uh, its activity during pregnancy is related to its status around the time of conception. So uh, calcium, vitamin D, and folic acid supplementation mirror that for ulcerative colitis. 
And for maintenance during asymptomatic periods, no regimen is universally effective. Sulfasalazine is effective for some, but the newer 5-ASA formulations are better tolerated. Prednisone therapy may control moderate to severe flares, but it is less effective for small bowel involvement. Immunomodulators such as azathioprine, 6 mercaptopurine and cyclosporine are used for active disease and for maintenance. As with ulcerative colitis, treatment with anti-tumor necrosis factor monoclonal antibodies is often used initially for active Crohn's disease and maintenance. Their discontinuance may be followed by a relapse. Endoscopy or conservative surgery is indicated for complicated cases of Crohn disease. The likelihood is greater that Crohn disease is associated with adverse pregnancy outcomes compared with ulcerative colitis. Next, we have intestinal obstruction. The incidence of bowel obstruction is not increased during pregnancy, although it is generally more difficult to diagnose. Now, most cases of intestinal obstruction during pregnancy result from pressure of the growing uterus on intestinal adhesions. This more likely occurs during or around mid-pregnancy when the uterus becomes an abdominal organ. In the third trimester, when the fetal head descends or immediately postpartum, when uterine size acutely shrinks. During pregnancy, mortality rates with obstruction can be excessive because of difficult and thus delayed diagnosis, reluctance to operate during pregnancy, and the need for emergency surgery. Next, we have colonic pseudo-obstruction. This is also known as the Ogilvy syndrome. Pseudo-obstruction is caused by adynamic colonic ileus. This is characterized by massive abdominal distension with cecal and right hemicolon dilatation. Approximately 10% of all cases are associated with pregnancy, and this syndrome usually develops postpartum, most commonly after cesarean delivery, but it has been reported antepartum. Rarely, the large bowel may rupture, and treatment with an intravenous infusion of neostigmine 2 mg usually results in prompt decompression. In some cases, colonoscopic decompression is performed and laparotomy is needed for perforation. Now, lastly, we have appendicitis. Pregnancy makes a diagnosis of appendicitis more difficult. Nausea and vomiting accompany normal pregnancy, but also, as the uterus enlarges, the appendix commonly moves upward and outward from the right lower quadrant. That's why the diagnosis of appendicitis as right lower quadrant pain usually is not applicable during pregnancy because of the uh, outward displacement or upward and outward displacement of the appendix during pregnancy. Now, some degree of leukocytosis is also common during pregnancy. So, leukocytosis will not really be helpful in diagnosing appendicitis. For this and other reasons, pregnant women, especially those late in gestation, frequently do not have clinical findings that are typical for appendicitis. Thus, it commonly is confused with cholecystitis, labor, pyelonephritis, renal colic, placental abruptio, or uterine leiomyoma degeneration. As the appendix is progressively deflected upward by the growing uterus, a mental containment of infection becomes increasingly unlikely. So how do we diagnose appendicitis during pregnancy? Persistent abdominal pain and tenderness are the most reproducible findings. Right lower quadrant pain is the most frequent, although pain uh, may migrate upward with appendicial displacement especially uh, during the later stages of pregnancy. Sonographic abdominal imaging is reasonable in suspected appendicitis even if to exclude an obstetrical cause of pain. When available, MRI is the preferred modality for evaluation of suspected appendicitis in pregnancy. MRI has a high diagnostic yield and accuracy and it also provides alternative diagnosis. So how do we manage appendicitis in pregnancy? When appendicitis is suspected in pregnant women, treatment is prompt surgical exploration. Currently, laparoscopy is almost always used to treat suspected appendicitis during the first two trimesters. 
laparoscopic surgery in pregnancy after 26 weeks or during the third trimester should only be performed by experienced laparoscopic surgeons. Before exploration, intravenous antimicrobial therapy should be uh, started usually with a second generation cephalosporin or third generation penicillin. Without generalized peritonitis, the prognosis is excellent. Uterine contractions are very common during uh, cases of appendicitis and so some clinicians recommend starting tocolytic agents. However, as a caveat, tocolytic use substantially increases the risk for pulmonary permeability edema caused by infection or sepsis syndrome. So when you want to use tocolytic agents in a pregnant woman with appendicitis, just exercise uh, caution. Antimicrobial versus surgical treatment for uh, cases of appendicitis? Well, this stems from the fact that European studies have advocated that many cases of appendicitis can be treated successfully with intravenous antimicrobials alone. Now, just to clear this um, issue, as of this time, this practice is still not recommended until appropriate studies have been done with pregnant women. Okay, so pregnancy outcomes for appendicitis include the following. So appendicitis increases the likelihood of abortion or preterm labor, especially if peritonitis has already developed. Long-term complications, though, are not very common. And appendicitis during pregnancy does not really appear to be associated with subsequent infertility. Okay, that's it for my lecture. So in summary, we have discussed diagnostic techniques of GI disorders, um, the application of nutritional support, upper GI tract disorders, and the last part is the small bowel and colon disorders. Thank you for watching this video and thank you for uh, listening to my lecture. Please don't forget to subscribe in my YouTube channel and my WordPress site, Dok Ina Thank you!